Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. We welcome you today to Signing Scientists. And maybe you're wondering what that means. Well, it will be an interview series with academic research leaders in the field. And we have selected scientists based on their personal success and achievements, their, meaning their publication, their success in grant funding, but also we selected people based on um, their support of deaf faculty, deaf students, and deaf researchers. And people who have deaf people at the heart of their research agenda. Our first interview is with Dr. Peter Hauser. Peter is currently the Interim Associate Dean of Research at RIT NTID, where he is the director of the NTID Research Center on Culture and Language. The CCL has evolved from the former Deaf Studies Laboratory, which he established in 2003. Today, the CCL has five laboratories, which receive funding from the NIH and the NSF. Dr. Hauser has over 50 publications and has presented internationally. Jessica Contreras will be leading the interview of Dr. Hauser. Jessica has worked with Dr. Hauser for over 10 years. She started as an undergraduate working to obtain her master's degree. And she is currently working with Dr. Hauser as an NTID in the NTID Research Center on Culture and Language as program coordinator for the past four years. The interview today um, will consist of question and answer, and Jessica will uh, look at the Q&A that has been posted for your access, and she will ask questions of Dr. Hauser at the end of the interview. And with that, I will turn it over to Jessica. Thank you. And this is Jessica. Thank you all for being here. I'm really thrilled to do this interview. Our first question, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became interested in science and who influenced and mentored you along the way? Sure. Well, let me say that growing up, I've always been fascinated by human behavior. I've always enjoyed people watching, analyzing what people are doing. And I've always been very curious. In the past, I thought that I couldn't work with other people. I grew up oral using spoken English, so communication was fairly limited, but I was always interested in science. And then in college, I learned sign language and I realized that through sign language, I could communicate with people. And that opened a lot of doors for me. It led me to ask a lot of questions and it opened up doors to future potential career opportunities for me. And in my second or third year of college, I decided that I was most interested in psychology. And for psychology, I felt that I would need a PhD. So I knew very early in my career that I wanted to be a psychologist and that I wanted to get my PhD. But again, psychology can look very different. There's clinical, cognitive, educational, all types of different subfields of psychology. I remember I was a dorm supervisor, an RA, and everyone in the dorm were either deaf or interpreting students. And they often faced a number of mental health issues. So at that time, I started looking for people who could help. I was in Connecticut at the time. And when I reached out, I could never find any psychologist or psychiatrist who did outpatient work. There was one psychologist who was fluent in ASL 
um, but they only did inpatient work and they were a ways away from the college. I did eventually find one clinical psychologist and that was the beginning for me. So to enter that program for the PhD program, I was required to have research experience. And I had worked in a lab that did research based on a survey about eating disorders. You may not have known that, Jessica. I did not know that. Yeah, that was my very first research experience in the first lab that I worked in. And then the second lab that I worked in did more classical learning theory experiments using pigeons. I didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah, I worked with pigeons, but I actually did the computer programming for the stimuli for that study, funny enough. And then for my senior project, I also did an independent study that was related to research and it wasn't required. A senior thesis wasn't required by my program, but we were allowed to do one if we wanted to. And so I decided to replicate another student's dissertation, looking at which language is best for deaf people to learn. So I had a story that I provided to participants in English, and then I also signed it to them in ASL, and I also signed it to them using signed English. I went through all of the steps. I got IRB approval. I went to a deaf residential school to collect data, even though I was only a senior in college. And I found that people best retained the English text, surprisingly enough, not when it was delivered in ASL or signed English. And so in my discussion, I mentioned the fact that there were really mixed communication modes within the students at the Deaf Residential School. Some of them had been mainstreamed and recently came to the Deaf Residential School. Some of them had very little exposure to ASL while others had a lot of exposure to ASL. So using sign English, of course, followed exactly the English words. My conclusion was also that students, because of their mixed communication backgrounds and mixed communication preferences, the English text was the best. And that was, that was a while ago. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And over the years, I've worked with a lot of different mentors, yeah. And were there any mentors who have stuck with you until today? You know, what's interesting is that all of my mentors have been women. During my PhD, the first formal mentor I had was Donna Marie, M-O-R-E-R-E. -E. She's a, she was a professor at Gallaudet University. She's retired now. And I really connected with her during my PhD interview because her background was in educational neuroscience. She was very interested in analyzing cognitive function and behavior. We had a great conversation. And that really inspired me to work with her in Gallaudet's clinical psychology program because of her knowledge of research and her interests. And then I worked with Irene Lay, who is a deaf woman. Donna was hearing. Irene is deaf, a deaf uh, psychologist with a PhD. And she was very strict and I needed that. I wasn't taking things very seriously when I was that young. So I needed someone to sort of pull me back in line and teach me how to behave. I don't know if I ever really 100% learned how to behave, but she certainly helped. <laughs> After I graduated, I did a postdoc with another hearing woman named Daphne Belvelier. She worked in clinical settings and did less basic research science, or excuse me, at Gallaudet, I had not done very much basic research science, but I had worked more in clinical settings. But working with Daphne, I was able to learn more basic research and she really helped me grow as a researcher. So those were my three really formational early mentors. Thank you, that really helps us. Now, our next question is, what is your vision for your research program and research agenda? What does success look like to you and how do you share that with members of your team? Sure, so I had mentioned my senior project. I was interested in how deaf people learn and that interest has really stuck with me until today. I'm still curious about how deaf people learn. 
And one of the questions about that is learn what? So I did my research project in my senior year, and then my final PhD dissertation was also on a similar topic. For my dissertation, I was looking at deaf people's inner voice. What type of inner voice do deaf people have? Is it in ASL? Is it in written or spoken English? How do deaf people think to themselves? But that really tied back to reading. So for hearing people, when they read, they often sound out what they're reading. So they're almost talking to themselves in their head. That's the typical inner voice for hearing people. But my question was, what does that look like for deaf people? So that's how I started. And then I realized that there were a number of different cognitive functions that are involved in reading and in learning. So I started diving more closely into those. And all of those, again, tie back to my interest in neuropsychology. When I'm evaluating a person, I need to understand their language. I need to understand their cognitive processes. I need to understand their psychosocial background as well, whether they have anxiety or depression. All of that influences a person's cognitive functioning. And I realized that there just wasn't a lot of research in a lot of these areas. I had to depend on what findings have been found about hearing people, but those don't always directly apply to deaf people. Sometimes deaf people function differently than hearing people. But throughout my career, my interests have also changed depending on the environment that I'm in. So my first job was as an assistant professor at RIT in their psychology department. And I, again, wanted to continue studying how deaf people learned, but my chair wasn't interested in that line of research. My chair at the time was hearing and wanted to publish one deaf-related publication, and they hadn't been able to, so they told me that it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth doing research with deaf people. And any time that they explained my research to other people, they just said, Dr. Hauser studies deaf people. That's all they ever said about it. So that's why I named my first lab the Deaf Studies Lab. I study deaf people. I run the Deaf Studies Lab. And that was in 2003, correct? That's right. I created that lab in 2003. And from there, I continued. And then NTID had a research position open up, and I thought that was a great opportunity for me to, again, study deaf people without worrying about getting approval for my different research topics for my chair. But that department was mostly interested in applied research. They wanted applied research, especially applied educational research, where I was more interested in basic science relating to neural networks, neuroplasticity, and topics like that. But again, my chair said that that wasn't applied research. And so I needed to shift my research topic over to something that could apply to educational, set, educational settings. So reading was close enough. So I partnered with, around the same time, Gallaudet University received a very large NSF grant to found the VL2 lab, the Visual Learning Visual Language Lab, which I know you remember, Jessica. And they strongly focused on reading. That's perfect. Yeah, it was a perfect fit. And there were other things, not just reading as well, but I joined that collaboration because they had funding and because reading was close enough to my interests. And now I not only study reading, but I also am involved in research related to deaf health literacy. So how deaf people know how to navigate the deaf healthcare system um, and, uh, and many other research topics as well. So you mentioned setting up the Deaf Studies Lab in 2003. Um, now, can you tell me about your current research center and how you got here from where you were in 2003? Sure, so in 2003, that was the Deaf Studies Lab, and that was a really interesting time. I was already working with a lab in the University of Rochester, which, which is only about 15 minutes away from here. I did my postdoc at the University of Rochester, so I already had good collaborators there. While I was teaching in the psychology department, there were a number of deaf students who needed co-op opportunities, basically internship opportunities, which they could do in research labs. For hearing students, it's pretty easy. They can work almost anywhere. But for deaf students, it's a lot more difficult, especially because back at that time, they couldn't request an interpreter for their internships. Interpreters were only provided in the classroom. They weren't provided for any activities outside of the classroom. I created the Deaf Studies Lab 
with all the students being volunteer, because back then RIT allowed students to volunteer. That's not allowed anymore. We have to pay everyone. But back then it was almost like a student club. The students who worked with me were so interested and so excited to do research that they volunteered. And many of them ended up doing their co-op in the DSL too. And that created learning opportunities for students and especially for deaf students. And then over time, we received grant funding from NIH and then NSF. We actually received both grants in the same year. So then we were able to hire students and hire more students and grow the Deaf Studies Lab. And it stayed as the Deaf Studies Lab for probably a good maybe 10 years or so. I, I couldn't tell you exactly, but about 10 years. And then NTID created a new building specifically to focus on research. And so I got my own space. Before I had never had my own space, I was able to take over an empty classroom or take over an office that had been left. I used whatever furniture people didn't want anymore. I collected furniture from all over campus. We had a very eclectic collection of furniture in the DSL. But then we had our own building. I could design the lab myself. I could pick out all of the furniture that we wanted in the new lab. And over time, too, I ended up collaborating with more faculty who wanted to join with me. And it wasn't just me doing research. It wasn't just my lab, but there were several of us who had labs. And so that's when I had the idea to create a center. It sort of just grew organically then. Exactly, exactly. And having a building helped. We didn't necessarily have a goal in mind, but right, it did happen organically. And then Dr. Jerry Buckley, NTD's president, named our center as the official center. And I forget the year that was. Do you remember? Oh, I'm going to say around 2015. I think so, too. I think around 2015. And it was initially called the Center on Cognition and Language. It was still the CCL, but it was the Center on Cognition and Language. Matt Dye also moved to Rochester from the University of Illinois to work at RIT. And he didn't have his own lab or his own space, so he worked in the center with me. Joseph Hill also joined the center. Dr. Tiffany Panko joined the center. She initially did her postdoc with us and then became a faculty in her own right. That is ironic because um, they were one of your first students, right? And you still have that um, connection, right? And yes, yes, in the first few years, actually, Tiffany Panko was one of my research assistants, as well as Jason Listman. And both of them are faculty now, which makes me feel really old. Um, but yes, there are pictures of the three of us together um, when they were undergrads. I should have brought those pictures, but I don't have them. Oh, so let's see. I had the Center on Cognition and Language. And then, like I said, Matt Dye was starting to get more grants on his own and Rossica Hall was created. And so there was a center available on the first level and Matt moved himself down to the first level of the building and created his own lab for cognition and I kept the language aspect of it. So I still kept the name CCL, but now it's called the Center on Culture and Language. And still the CCL. Huh. I think that's a perfect segue into the next question. So now there is a growing understanding that good research requires a team of scientists from many different disciplines, interdisciplinary teams. What is your approach to putting together successful teams, especially interdisciplinary teams? I feel like at my age, I'm sort of um, kind of at the time where things are changing a little bit. I started my career at a time when it was better to stay in one field, um, to continue publishing and to, to keep that up for the whole, the entirety of your career. And now there's a different approach. And I seem to have navigated that as things have evolved. So I've seen what that whole process has looked like. Um, 
honestly, um, historically, this has seemed like the white male club. Um, you know, all white males get together and um, talk about everything in the same way. They validate their own fields and ignore everyone else. It seems that we're always talking either about each other or to each other, and that's been the culture. And there hasn't been any, any value of research methods or um, the appropriate interpretation of research results. But I'm very thankful to VL2 for helping me to sort of broaden my horizons and see each researcher for their own strengths and weaknesses. You know, we all have strengths. We all have weaknesses. And so I have begun to realize over my career that whatever research question you have, and the answer you find is really going to be dependent on the researcher and the methodology and the tools that you use. And sometimes that specific research question isn't best answered in this specific methodology or with these specific tools. What I found is that if you don't have the right method or you don't have the right tools, you need to collaborate. And that hadn't been happening historically. And so once that collaboration started to happen, I saw this great benefit. There was a sharing of ideas and innovation. Um, and initially I felt a little bit uh, threatened by this because of, you know, in that older white male research group, they might have felt a little bit threatened because maybe their weaknesses were being revealed. But the more... Um, open-minded and um, empathetic and understanding individuals saw the benefit in this. And so team science is definitely the way to go. Um, it's, you know, there's no way that one person can, can know everything. It's just impossible. Um, and so I know now that what I don't know, someone else does. So we work together. Sure, so related to the idea of teamwork, team science, I'm wondering about collaboration between deaf and hearing teams. How does that happen successfully in your experience? Well, I've seen situations where it's very successful and some where it's not. Um, sometimes it's a deaf hearing issue and sometimes it's just a people issue. Um, I've had collaborations that didn't work out at all and some that really went well. Um, and it's a really it's a mixture of deaf and hearing and mostly it's based on personality. What I have seen is a lot of tokenism. And what I mean by that is that um, hearing people may want to study deaf people, but they need a deaf person involved in, on the team. And so I'm brought in as part of the team. And my role in that is just to collect data. And they bring in an interpreter and I am not privy to all of the conversation that's happening on happening in that group, but um, you know, they feel that I need to be there. And so that's the tokenism that I've experienced, but there is benefit in deaf and hearing collaboration. I see it happening the best when everybody is working together. Uh, for example, doing a project design. You know, sometimes it takes some patience. Each person may have an idea and um, it's really a sharing opportunity. Um, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, I'll, I'll explain that later. Um, but, you know, sometimes hearing people will just go and do it. And then they're share, sharing the data without including me. And I'm like, where is that partnership? Uh, but sometimes it works out really well. It just varies. Sure. So that really comes back to mentoring, guidance, and leadership. So as an academic leader yourself, what is your perspective and approaches on mentoring? mentoring deaf hearing and hard of hearing? Well, so we can go back to 2003 when I established the Deaf Studies Lab. Um, remember, I created it because deaf students needed co-ops. And at that time, 
Um, I was just starting to learn about tokenism and autism um, and how some deaf people feel that they need to work twice as hard to gain the same respect. Um, and people, even these students, uh, experienced oppression from their hearing teachers, you know, and I've been through it and I did want to support them. Um, some of them were able to fight for what they needed and others um, struggled more. And so part of DSL's success is that it was a safe space for deaf people where deaf people could just come into the lab. And I remember um, that people would come into the lab obviously for work, but people would stay even after their shift and do their homework because it felt safe. I did that myself, yep. You know, it's exhausting being in classes with hearing faculty and hearing students, and you kind of have to play the game. In the lab, you didn't have to worry about eating too loud or making too much noise. You didn't have to be concerned about any of that. And it just felt, it, you could just be deaf. You could just be yourself and you could focus on the science. And part of, that's the one part of DSL that I've tried to, to keep up, even as we've grown. I value the culture that we had, that we began with, in keeping this a deaf space. There are very few of those in the world. I mean, think about a scientific space um, where you don't have to act in a way that works for the hearing people. You know, most of the time you're, you're working with hearing people and you're, it's not a safe space because you're concerned about the noise you're making or the, what your breathing sounds like. Maybe around the year 2010, I started kind of doing a little self-assessment and trying to think about um, the ideal mentor. So I started looking into what was happening and I realized that we needed to give that deaf capital, that knowledge that deaf people have of academia and science. Once I started doing that, people started going into PhD programs and staying and graduating. And I realized that deaf people have information to share with other deaf people. Tools about being deaf, yeah. Anything else you want to add about mentoring? Well, from there, uh, we established the Bridges program. That's the Rochester Bridge to the Doctorate. It's funded by NIH, and the goal is to get deaf students into biomedical fields. fields. I had been trying to do something similar to this for psychology, and now I was being asked by NTID to do it in biomedical fields. And, you know, that's not my background. And so I had to figure out what exactly those students needed. And really, I had to mentor the mentors, too, because a lot of the mentors were hearing and I needed to provide them with the skills that they needed in order to be good mentors to these deaf future PhD students. Derek Braun, among others, and Diane Clark were the models really for this. And one of the questions we were asking was, do all of the mentors need to be deaf? And they don't. But what they do need is um, to be sensitive to the needs of deaf students. They don't, they should not be oppressive or should not look down on the students, but they should provide them with the information that they need and they should be a person for the deaf student to bounce ideas off of. And so that's where the idea for Bridges came from and where it has gone from there. Wow, so not only mentoring, but also the aspect of mentoring that goes back to inspiring others. So how do you inspire deaf and hard of hearing students? And then how do those students inspire you too? Uh, that's a good question. 
The way I see that I have inspired students is um, by the way they, they behave and what they've told me later in their lives. Um, some of them have said um, they didn't realize they could do this until they met me. Um, I'm going to use the person's name because I know they don't care. Uh, Alicia Allen. So Alicia was actually one of my very first students in 2002 when I came to RIT, yes, in psychology. And she did go on to get her PhD. Um, she was looking to get her, a master's degree to be a VR counselor, and I thought she had so much potential. So I really um, encouraged her to continue on in her education. Um, and she wasn't really sure she wanted to um, go into psychology. As an assistant professor, I would often advise people outside of my building and I would stand out there in my, you know, jeans and t-shirts and smoking and, um, and she would see me and she thought, well, you know, if Peter can do that, so can I. And so this is a little bit um, not related to your question, but there was a conference in Washington, D.C. I can't remember the exact conference, but the conference was hosted by the NSF and I can't remember the topic, but we had a VL2 poster. And right next to the poster was a deaf person and it was an undergraduate deaf student from Alaska. And their undergrad degree was in animal science. And so we struck up a conversation and I was uh, amazed at this and uh, just the way that the person described um, scientific concepts I thought well boy you should go to veterinary school and they didn't think that they could and so I informed them that there are several veterinarians who are deaf and I contact or I connected this person with some of those um, deaf veterinarians. And it was just one little idea that allowed this person uh, to grow. So related to the idea, you said people say deaf can't do that. And of course, we know that deaf people can do anything. So how do you grow the number of deaf and hard of hearing people who become successful scientists in research? This is Peter. Honestly, hearing people create so many barriers that are just unnecessary. We have enough barriers ourselves already, you know, communication barriers. And I think deaf people who want to become scientists have to realize that autism is out there. We have to deal with it and we have to persist despite it. And we have to fight we know, Jessica, how many times every semester do we have to fight for access to academic research conferences? Always. Yeah, it's, yep, it's an ongoing issue. We often reach out, we're told no, and we know that we are right and they're wrong. So we have to keep going. We have to persist. And people who work with me now often tell me that, you know, deaf people never really fully get up to the level of hearing people. They deaf people have gaps in their knowledge and gaps in their skills that they need to fill. Oh. <laughs> yes, exactly. You have opened their eyes. Right, right. Um, so I've, I've certainly noticed that and we've opened their eyes. So I would say um, occasionally um, collaborations cause some sticky moments. Um, differences of opinion, miscommunication. How do you deal with this? Sure. I have faced those issues myself with collaborators and then also with some of the Bridges scholars who work under my center too. It helps when they see that I understand what they're going through because that in and of itself is a very powerful thing, knowing that someone else gets it. You know, I see this problem is happening. Let's talk about it. 
instead of being told that they're exaggerating or it's not really a big issue or having some sort of other tone about this, it's important to listen to other people, take them seriously, and then sit down to talk about it. And then sometimes people just need to vent. Sometimes I sit down with someone, they vent, they get it off their chest, and then it's over, it's done, it's fine. But sometimes situations can also become toxic. I can think of, for example, a student working with a mentor where the relationship just became toxic. And I can think of an example where, and this is from a while ago, not currently, the student was a woman of color who was deaf and the mentor treated them just like any other undergraduate research assistant. And that mentor was also uh, an administrator and again, at a different university, not here. And so part of the difficulty is also navigating how to leave a situation when it's just not the right time and place. How to leave a situation if it's becoming toxic and find a better placement. Change of mentor, change of PI. Sometimes that's the only way to resolve that type of situation. There are a lot of different uh, sticky situations that can come up. Another example is IRB related, the Institutional Review Board for Human Subjects Protection. Protection. I can think of another group who I have worked with seeing that their IRB ethical practices didn't seem very appropriate, didn't seem very ethical. And federal regulations require us to strictly follow the IRB. And so sometimes in that type of situation, the only thing we can do is report it. But again, if a deaf student is working in a lab, a predominantly hearing lab, if a deaf student sees something unethical, sometimes it's also difficult to explain that to someone else and difficult to even approach uh, someone higher up because that person higher up may just assume that the other person is doing what they're supposed to. The deaf student is really powerless in that situation. So it's helpful to go to someone with more power who can help you navigate that situation if you are in that situation. Yes, that's definitely challenging. Um, I do know that sometimes um, research is fraught with frustration. Um, things don't always work, work out. How do you advise students um, to help them deal with that? And what advice would you give students or other researchers to help them deal with those frustrations? Um, this is your final question to share, just letting you know. Well, right now in my role as Interim Associate Dean of Research, for the past five years or so, I have been mentoring assistant professors. I started mentoring undergraduate students and then the older I became, the people I mentored also became older somehow. <laughs> um, I guess going back to those students who formerly worked with me in DSL, now they are themselves assistant and even associate tenured professors too. So I have been mentoring assistant professors for the past five years or so. And I talk with them about sometimes they have a publication rejected or a grant proposal rejected. And the first feeling you get is always heartbreak. It hurts, it hurts a lot every time. It doesn't matter if you're hearing or you're deaf, it hurts to have that type of rejection. It's an emotional process. I think it's almost like the grieving process. You go through anger, denial, and then finally acceptance. I really do think it's, it's the same, and there's no real way around it. Part of that is just growing up as a scientist, is going through those difficult moments of rejection. You know, I had a lot of time to write during COVID, so I've been submitting a lot of articles for potential publication, and some of them have been rejected and some of them haven't. But I like that. I think that's part of the game as a scientist. And when you get a letter of rejection, it always has good feedback. It always helps me improve next time. It helps me improve my science, the work that I do. It's not a problem for me now. In the past, it was. In the past, I felt hurt or I felt like they just didn't understand deaf people. And sometimes I do still have to fight. So for example, in writing, I always say deaf people or deaf children. And the editor of one journal responded back to me and said that I was required to follow the guidelines by the World Health Organization, which is don't, um, 
don't put a deaf person or a disabled person, always put a person who is deaf or people who are deaf, always use person first language. And I responded back to say, no, in the deaf community, we prefer to have that cultural identity label for ourselves to be put first, deaf people, deaf scientists, and so on. So I was able to write back to the editor and educate them. But that was, you know, later in my career, if it was my very first publication, I might have been a little bit more overwhelmed than I was and might not have been able to respond. All right. Well, I think that this has been perfect timing and I will give it back to Matt to take questions from our audience. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us, Dr. Hauser. This is Matt. Thank you so much, Jessica. So now we have time for some questions and answers, and I will try my best to interpret the questions from the Q&A. I am seeing some questions come up now. So the first question is from an anonymous asker. Can you talk about some of your research and your research findings? Sure. So I would have to start with my dissertation. It's been an interesting journey from my dissertation topic to where I am now. My dissertation was about deaf people's inner voice, like I mentioned, and specifically what deaf people do when they're reading. Now, I firmly believe that many people think that deaf people have to have phonological encoding skills to be able to read. That's a very strong belief that deaf people must be able to sound out the phonemes of words, just like hearing people do when they read. But in my dissertation, and I won't go into too much detail here, but basically my dissertation findings suggest that phonemes do not necessarily have to have the same phonetics as hearing people when they read English. Meaning, for example, to process the sound CH or CH, we have that phoneme. For hearing people, that involves a, a burst of air. But for deaf people, obviously, um, deaf people may equate it more with the mouth morpheme that they see, representing the sound for CH, even though it doesn't sound exactly the same as what hearing people hear. And then later in my research with VL2, I realized that it was actually almost the opposite. They collected data from deaf people in the United States, as well as deaf people in Germany and Israel. And in Israel, they collected data both from people who used Hebrew and from people who used Arabic spoken languages, um, and also from Turkey as well. When they analyzed all of the data, they realized that phonological coding isn't actually important to be able to read. So my dissertation findings basically didn't matter at that point. But as VL2 studied more, we realized that there are actually many different pathways. Of course, people are neurodiverse. Uh, people can process reading either using this pathway, using the phonetical pathway, or using this other pathway, or other different pathways too. But my interest isn't necessarily just in reading. My interest has always been in sign language assessment. And sign language assessment itself was uh, something that I got into by accident. It was something that I ran into during my clinical psychology work. And then I also worked with a collaborator who was working with a postdoc trying to create an ASL test. The postdoc had left with their work half completed, and so it was given to me to finish it. And that became the most popular project for people outside of the lab. Um, people often contacted me wanting to know more about the ASL language assessment testing. And basically the question of how can we best measure ASL skills for research documentation purposes? How do we measure whether someone is actually fluent? And so that became another research interest of mine. And I've been able to publish several articles about ASL assessment. And we're still working on the assessment so that it may in the future potentially be used for clinical purposes as well. One of the topics on my back burner that I've always wanted to study is autism. But I never had a way to fit it in with my current research agenda until just now, very recently. So I think, I think that's a good summary of my research interests. All right. Um, we have a question from Elizabeth Ayers. Your journey is fascinating. 
What other research would you like to see added to current research in Rosca Hall? So far there's culture, language, neuro, health. Um, what else would you like to add? Sure, well, the CCL is growing now with five labs and there are different projects going on in each of those labs. One of the things I haven't talked about here yet is health related research. That still relates back to learning and how do deaf people learn health information, specifically learning health information online is what one of our projects is looking at. So the different characteristics of diverse deaf people, again, depending on their ASL skills, their English skills, their reading and math skills, their intellectual capability, their health literacy, all of these different factors, how do those factors align to affect how someone acquires and uses health information? That helps us understand how best to present health-related information for deaf people. And this is a particularly important topic, especially these days. So this research project was started before COVID, but we hadn't finished the project when the pandemic started. The project includes 450 deaf participants and 450 hearing participants all over the country. And we were able to follow up with them through COVID. And that has resulted in two, publica two publications so far. So that's a hot topic. Okay, I see a question from Athena Willis and she says, what's next for you over the next five to 10 years? And this is Peter. I have two um, pretty significant goals. Um, I would like to encourage more um, lab directors. I would like to see more deaf people be directors, more um, principal investigators here. I would also like to focus my research on sign language assessment and the impacts of autism on education and mental health. I'm very excited to see more research in that area. All right, the next question is from an anonymous attendee. They want to know, will you continue working with Ted Supala at Georgetown University? Oh, uh, at George, Georgetown. Well, no, I'm not working with Ted anymore. Um, he kind of felt like my um, academic father. He really did uh, teach me a lot. He was one of my mentors during my postdoc. And he also mentored me during my, the interview process for my first job here. Um, he encouraged me to get the assistant professor position. So he was my mentor during that whole time period. So um, every time I see him, I give him a big hug. And let's see, I think the last time I saw him was at AAAS. Um, it was maybe seven years ago I presented there. Um, he's he moved to Georgetown and he's been at Washington DC. And since then our uh, collaboration has fizzled. Yeah, he's wonderful. I've had the opportunity to collaborate with him too. That's great. Let me see. The next question here is from Surya. His question is, from your work up until now, what has been your biggest concern? and how did you manage it? And he also asks a second question. What is What are the trending topics that you would advise future researchers to keep an eye out for? Let's see, um, I guess my concerns have changed over the years. Initially, my concern was my identity as a scientist and trying to just build up my identity. 
I had confidence in my ability as a clinician. I had a lot of experience working with patients, but um, as a research scientist, I hadn't quite I, um, established that identity until I started working with VL2. Then I started to kind of get an understanding of who I am and who I'm not. Um, those boundaries were established. Um, I don't really have that concern anymore. I don't feel as though I need to prove myself. Um, I don't feel like um, a bad person because I don't know the names of scientists that are being presented to me. Um, I'm maybe more concerned about maintaining my status as a PI, um, you know, funding. I, I don't want to run out of my, my funding for my center because then my staff in the center um, lose their jobs. And also, you know, during COVID, I was concerned about the PIs and center staff's um, mental health. Um, that was a big concern of mine. Well, I guess one big concern is that we don't really have enough people to accomplish everything we want to accomplish. There are so many ideas and not enough qualified researchers to make it all happen. And so I guess what we really need is to have more people involved. Um, let's see, uh, hot topics. Um, I guess it just depends on the field. Um, maybe sign language, uh, linguistics, iconicity, Honestly, I'm probably a little biased, but I think that autism is a hot topic, but there really isn't any um, published work on it. There's a lot of discussion about racism and a lot of publication on racism. Um, last week was the first time in history that I saw a formal presentation titled Introduction to Autism here at NTID. And last year at Gallaudet was the first time that that topic was presented. And it's more of a social, socio-psycho, cultural, anthropological topic that is being discussed a little bit more now. The next question is from Allison, who says that they grew up in an oral family who doesn't sign and they have a cochlear implant. Most of the time they can read quickly and don't read with an inner voice. But when they really need to focus on a text, they do read with an inner voice. So the question is, is that the same for most people hearing and deaf? Well, from my understanding of hearing people, it's very much the same. Um, people get past that sound out phase of reading that's mostly taking place um, during the initial instruction of reading and fluency. And eventually um, that's not necessary anymore, but there are multiple ways to be a successful reader. Um, and honestly, if one method doesn't work, there are several others to go with. Um, sometimes uh, people just get focused so much on sound-based reading that they, they get frustrated when someone's not able to do that. But there are other strategies that work. All right, we have time for a few more questions. So an anonymous person is asking, they say, your life force is inspiring and your work is also inspiring. Do you work with students on how best to work with interpreters as partners and how to adjust for interpreting access to be successful in conferences and other presentations? During my PhD program, I was, I was in an internship well, it's actually, it was called an externship because 
Um, I basically was going to work two days a week, a week at the same time I was taking classes. Um, and I was in the Washington, D.C. court system where I was tasked with evaluating children who had been accused of something um, criminal. And so those children were referred to me for further assessment. And I ended up having the same interpreter for the whole externship. And this interpreter was amazing and was also a CODA. And we honestly learned how to work together because I was doing psychological testing for hearing children. And I didn't want um, the interpreter involved in the process skewing the results. So we had a lot of conversation on how to best make this work. And I'm very thankful to that interpreter for educating me on working with interpreters. So I realized over the years that I do need to work with one interpreter who knows how to work with me. Um, and then later we did um, a book chapter on how to work with a designated interpreter. I actually just finished a, a book chapter um, that discusses the model of using a designated interpreter. And really, they are my voice. They are my existence. Um, if I'm always having a different interpreter, I, I feel that my voice is lost. And I don't feel that um, my voice is heard. It's, it's this gamble every time. And so if I can control who I want to be and what I sound like, um, just like during this talk. Um, initially, when Matt invited me to present, um, we had a couple interpreters who were already assigned. And I asked if I could bring in my own interpreter. And Matt said, oh, obviously, of course. Um, you know, and even having my own interpreter who works with me all the time there's always errors that occur but it's important if I, that i work with the same interpreter all the time so that i can they can best represent who i am and who my what my voice is and i really value working closely with that interpreter all right our time is coming to an end i think we will have to close at this point but again peter thank you so much and to Jessica, thank you as well. And to my coworker, Rain, and Kirsten, who also helped organize this. Thank you all so much for your work. And thank you, Matt, for hosting. Thank you all for coming. And thank you again to Dr. Hauser and to Jessica. Thank you all. Take care. <laughs>